people, for I know, wildly though the winds may blow, I've an anchor safe and sure that can evermore endure, and it holds my anchor holds. Blow your wildest in, O oh gale, on oh my bark so small and frail, by his grace I shall not fail, for my anchor. tempest rises high still I stand the tempest shock for my anchor grips the rock and it holds my anchor holds blow your wildest in O gale on oh, my bark so small and frail by his grace I shall not fail for my anchor meet each sudden blast and the cable though unseen bears the heavy strain between through the storm I safely ride till the turning of the tide and it holds my anchor holds blow your wildest in O gale on my bark so small and frail by his grace shall not fail for my anchor holds my anchor holds troubles almost whelm the soul griefs like billows o'er me roll tempters seek to lure astray storms obscure the light of day but in Christ I can be bold I've an anchor shall hold and it holds my anchor holds blow your wildest in O gale on my bark so small and frail by his grace I shall not fail for my anchor holds my anchor holds all righty come on forward gentlemen if you would and uh are you playing for the offertory? Or you're playing for the offertory, right? Did you know that? Well, guess what? You're playing for the offertory. And uh, so, uh, all righty. So we'll, we'll be letting her make her way up to the piano. Thank you for being here tonight. A couple of real quick announcements. We'll go ahead and get these out of the way. And in a few moments, I'm out of the way because I'm finished for the night. All right? And uh, so I'm taking the night off, and you all are on, and then he's on behind you. All right? So, uh, so set him up good. All right? So, and uh, we we'll appreciate them being here tonight. We're thankful for their spirit. And they're going to sing for us in a little bit, and a few songs, but our king's going to preach for us. Don't forget, uh, men's Bible study, Tuesday, 6 o'clock, and then uh, our Monday evening school of the Bible uh, at 6 o'clock on the, February the 4th as we kick everything back off there for this semester, so don't forget about that. And ladies' Bible st study on the 7th. And then don't forget, be in prayer for Brother Randy and Shirley Starr. They'll be making their way out here on the 8th, and then they'll be with us all day on the 10th. Looking forward to their meeting with us here. And there's so many things going on, and I'd encourage you, I said earlier, but I'd encourage you to pray for the, the Bible study there at our state capitol. Uh, it seems like the Lord is doing something. Uh, we had, we've been in there in the now state capitol for about seven years, and the first couple of years was very, very slow. We didn't really get anything a couple of sec except a couple of secretaries going. But now there's two Bible studies going, and uh, so we're thankful for that. And now, again, we've got some senators and representatives both coming and some of their families, and we're thankful for that. We've got to know more of the folks there, and we're praising the Lord for what he's doing. Amen? And so let's see, be in prayer for that. Be in prayer for those that are now the session is in. Be in prayer for the body as they uh, help uh, govern our state, and then they represent us there in Washington as well. So let's be in prayer uh, for those things and, and things going on with our country. And, of course, the shutdown has come to at least a temporary end, uh, and then we'll see what happens in the next three weeks about that. But... Uh, let's be in prayer for the decisions being made by those that guide our nation. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, Brother Von Hyde, I want you to pray for our offering tonight. Lord, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this time we have to gather together. We thank you for these people that come from Charlie, Father Brown, this morning. We pray, Father, for your safety. We pray, Lord, on the country and on the whole country, too. 
First, you are, they are, but we'll go ahead and have the singing group come. Be in prayer. Uh, we'd invited, I'd called Brother Bobby Goins, was hoping he would come tonight and be able to be with us here. And the new church plant there, the new Spanish church plant. And Miss Paula is actually from Columbia, South America, and I thought she might meet them, not like to meet a few of these folks. And uh, uh, But uh, he's actually preaching for Brother Jay tonight, so he couldn't come. And uh, But he said, I'll come by after church, Brother O. I'm sure y'all will still be there. <laughs> He has an amazing way of encouraging me, you know. And uh, so you be in prayer for Brother Bobby as he's preaching for Jay tonight. Be in prayer for this group and Brother King here for serve with us. Amen. <laughs> What a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wander in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, and I'm telling him, made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, made me whole. My sins are washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified truly through Calvary's love, oh what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace, he did proffer, he saved me, all oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now of a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of the wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. Heaven came down, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul.
evening, everybody. We're from Hiles, Anderson, Hiles Anderson College. So sorry, I my tongue gets out. <laughs> um, and we're so excited to be here. For real. and my name is Grace Campbell. I'm a junior this year, and I'm from Panama City, Panama. Hello, everybody. My name is Jan Lady Batista, and I'm from the Dominican Republic, and I'm a 2018 graduate. Hi, my name is Joshua Campbell, and I'm a sophomore. I'm studying pastoral theology, and I'm from Panama City as well. Girls and I are twins, by the way, mm -hmm. you can tell. <laughs> uh, and then on the piano, we have Michaela Murray, and she's from Temperance, Michigan, and she's, she's a junior. Defeated by sin and filled with regret This wasn't the first time, how could he forget? With one plea for mercy, God's presence drew near How can this be happening? My eyes filled with tears now I, I lift my hands and I'll testify that my soul's been rescued and given new life. A prisoner of sin set free through his blood, for I am forgiven and covered in day has its battles and still I may fall but his hands will catch me to guide me along so I, I live to serve him for all that he's done Lord let me say thank you for the battles you've won now my hands and I'll testify that my soul's been rescued and given new life. A prisoner of sin set free through his blood for I am forgiven and covered in love. I've been covered my head and I'll testify that my soul's been rescued and given new life. A prisoner of sin, so free through his blood, for I am forgiven. Oh, I've been forgiven. Covered in love, and covered in love. Oh, we call me more. Like Jesus feels like dying deep inside And sometimes I guess that's truly what it is Cause he's calling me to lay aside my selfishness and pride So he can mold my heart and make it more like his And lately I've been Seeing more each day The wisdom and new wonders of His grace Just as I am I ran to Him and mercy took me in Just as I am And He forgave my sin All the way He's changing my heart proves He loves me too much to leave me just as I am. 
Oh, my heart is simply clay within the potter's skillful hands. Even though the changes sometimes ride in me. Oh, I want the truth of His Word to keep shaping who I am. Because I know that He does all things perfectly. And all my thoughts and all my attitudes, they're all His to change as He wants to. Just as I am, I ran to Him and mercy took me in. Just as I am, and He forgave my sin. All the way He's changing my heart proves He loves me too much to leave me. Just as, Just as I am, I ran to Him and mercy took me in. Just as I am, and He forgave my sin. Just as I am, I ran to Him and mercy took me in. Just as I am, and He forgave my sin. All the way He's changing my heart proves He loves me too much to leave me just as I am. Amen. Thank you, young people. They'll be back up in just a minute. Um, aren't you glad that he loves you? He'll save you just as you are, but aren't you glad he loves you too much to leave you that way? I'm so thankful for that. As Preacher mentioned, we're from Hiles Anderson College. My name is Aaron King. I'm here with my wife, Amanda. She is by far the better part of me. We've been married for uh, 20 years this last year, and we have four children. Our oldest is a sophomore in college, and we've got two in high school, and one that is seven years old and in second grade, and she is the pistol of the family that keeps the rest of us in shape. But we're thrilled to be here. We really are. We're thrilled to be anywhere other than Northwest Indiana right now with a high on Wednesday that's negative 15 degrees. And so we're thrilled to be with you. It's snowing up there. We're praying maybe our flight get canceled tomorrow and we get to stay in Arizona for another month or so. But uh, we really are. We're, we're honored to be here. And we're honored to have Tommy. I can't tell you. He is a blessing to me. Um, you all have known him, of course, longer than I have, but every time I see that kid, he's smiling in the hallways, always greets me and tells me to have a great day or got some story for me or something. And I just love being around young people, especially. I spent 18 years as a youth pastor and a pastor and uh, now working at the college and thrilled to do that. But I like being around young people that are enjoying life and love the Lord, and I believe Tommy is one of those young people, and he's a blessing to us. I appreciate you sending him, and uh, continue to pray for him. I always tell churches, if you've, got, if you've got young people anywhere in college, pray for them. Um, so I'm, I appreciate that. But Hiles Anderson College, um, for those of you that may not be real familiar with it, I know some of you all have been up there to visit, and we appreciate you making the long trip up there, but uh, our, our goal at Hiles Anderson College is to train and prepare young people to reach other people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then to take them from there and teach them and train them to go and do the same. To live a life for God, to raise families for God. And we have uh, majors that any, anywhere from general studies and missions and education and media and of course pastoral theology and youth pastors and music and all these different things. But all of them with the number one focus of reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're going to learn media, you're going to learn how to use media to reach people for Jesus. If you're going to learn music, you're going to learn how to use music to reach people for the cause of Christ. And that is our heart's desire. 35,000 plus young people have come through the doors of Hiles Anderson College. We've got graduates ministering in all 50 states and over 50 foreign countries with that purpose of reaching people for Christ. And uh, that is our heart's desire. That's what, we, that's what we love to do. All of these young people that are up here uh, today are on bus routes every week. 
door knocking on Saturdays, going and picking up kids, working in junior churches, working in Sunday school classes every single week. And it's a huge blessing. It's a huge part of what we do. Um, any of you young people that are here, uh, if you're 6th through 12th grade and you would like more information, there's information cards back on the table. You're welcome to fill one of those out. We'd be happy to get you any information you'd like. Those that are juniors, seniors, maybe young adults, considering, and you say, I'd, li I'd like more information, I would consider maybe Hiles Anderson College, or if you know somebody else that would, we do have applications, but we'd just be happy to answer your questions. If you've got questions about our school, we'd, we'd love to, to answer those questions. We do have music CDs back on the table. They're $15 a piece, two or more for $10. And uh, our heart's desire, even with the, with the music CDs, is to help people to fill their homes and fill their lives with godly music. The, the power of godly music in a home, in a life, for an individual, for a family, in our home. Um, if, if, things, if there's a lot of tension, a lot going on, a lot of stress, maybe kids are upset or whatever the case may be, uh, oftentimes the first thing my wife will do is go over to the CD player and put in a good godly CD of Christian music and you turn that on and it's amazing in 30 seconds the difference that it makes in the spirit of our home. And I tell people all the time, don't ever, don't ever forget what the devil did in heaven before he fell. He knows how to use music. He knows how to use music. The only one who knows music better than the devil is the Lord himself. And God stresses throughout the Bible the power of music. So I'd encourage you, whether it's from us, you can go online and get some of our music, but also there's a lot of other good sources for godly music. But music is to honor God, and it has, it has a great effect over our spirit. And so I want to encourage you, fill your home with godly music. And for young people, as you get to that place in your life where you're ready to consider Bible college, let me ask you to do a couple things. Number one, pray about it. Parents, pray with your kids about college and what God would have for their future. Many, many young people make the decisions for the rest of their life, how they're going to prepare for the rest of their life without ever really spending any meaningful time in prayer about it. They look at how much money will this pay me, or they look at what do I like to do, what do I enjoy, and never really give much consideration to what does God want me to do. Number one, I'd say pray about it. Number two, talk to your parents. Ask for their counsel, ask for their advice. And number three, talk to your pastor. And then after you've done those things, after you've prayed about it, you've talked to your pastor and you've talked to your parents, go and do exactly what your parents and pastor tell you to do. You'll never, ever be sorry as a young person for doing what your parents and your preacher tell you to do. Because they answer for it. If they tell you wrong, God's going to hold them accountable for it, right? <laughs> I've got kids of my own. When I was in high school, my dad happened to be my pastor. And I just went to him as a senior in high school. I said, Dad, what do you want me to do after high school? He said, I want you to go to Hiles Anderson College. That was the end of the discussion for me. That's what I did because that's what my dad told me he wanted me to do. And uh, there's, there's a, a lot of liberty in that, but God will bless that. And I'd encourage young people, young adults, um, parents, talk to your pastor. Parents, talk to pastor about what he believes God would have for, for your children. Um, God, God's given you a spiritual shepherd in your life for a reason. And so I, that, that's the only thing. I, I tell people that everywhere. That's my heart. If, if God leads a young person to Hiles Anderson College, we're thrilled to have them. We really are. But if Hiles Anderson College isn't where God wants them, we want them to be where God wants them. And so that's, that's our desire. There's a lot of great places, and we, we're a little bit biased at Hiles Anderson College because that's where we are. That's where we're from. <laughs> I'd say it's a great place to get a wife because that's where I got my wife. <laughs> and so, uh, no, I, I'm thankful. We're thankful for the opportunity to be here, really, and thrilled. I got to meet your preacher last fall and had lunch with him, and um, it's, it's an honor. I, I believe God's given you a great, a great pastor here. Amen. And uh, support him. We thank God for him every day. Pray for him every day. I love the sign on the front of his desk. I took a picture of it. If you haven't seen it, you need to. <laughs> Um, I, I, I love that. I think every preacher should have that on the front of his desk. That's a blessing. But no, it's, it's a privilege for us to be here. The young people are going to come back and sing a few more songs. One of them is going to share a testimony with you, and then I'll preach after that. Don't worry, I don't preach long. <laughs> me 
amazing love how can it be that you send your son to die how my soul does rejoice just in the thought that i am justified i feel freedom freedom from the chains that have bound my soul to the grave but praise god ever since that day The cross lifted up, they are gone, hallelujah, I'm free, my sins are gone. How can I tell you what happened inside? The day my soul was redeemed, my ship it was sinking all on its own, anchored in uncertainties. But my Jesus, Jesus he reached out his hand, and he lifted my burden of sin. Because of what my Savior did, they are all gone, the chains that are gone, I'm moving on, new heights I have reached, the way laid on me, the cross lifted up, they are gone, hallelujah. like I said before, I'm from the Dominican Republic, and um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, uh, but my grandma was the only one in the house who was Christian, and uh, my brother, he got saved at a young age, and um, practically, when you're a kid, you don't have, you have no option to go to church, because your parents or your grandpa, your grandma, she took me. And when I was growing up, she was forcing me to go to church. I didn't want to go because my mom didn't want to go either. So um, when I, I remember that the only reason that I, that I went to church, it was because if you have a perfect att attendance the whole year, there's a church that they, they, send, they send toys to, to, our, to our church. So that toy will be wrapped and you will have your name and your age. That was the only reason I went to the church the whole year so I can see that toy, that big toy with my name there. And, um, but the Lord did something in my life. And one day at Sunday school class, uh, there is this lady at my church that she was, uh, she was teaching and she was talking about Jesus. And all of a sudden she started talking about hell. And as a seven-year-old, when you hear somebody talking about hell, and, you, and they give you an example, like very graphic example about hell, you just start crying. You're like, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to hell. And uh, that's, that, that's 
how I got saved. She, t she, she talked to me because I was really scared. I didn't want to go to hell. So she talked to me, and I, and I got saved when I was seven years old. But when I was 17 years old, I, when I was 16 years old, 16 or 17, I, I, was, I wasn't sure of my salvation. So I talked with somebody You know, at a youth conference, I talked with somebody, and I got insurance of my salvation. And um, then um, I went to a conference. The, 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 the year after, I went to a conference, and I got, um, the, the Lord called me to, to serve in full time. But you know, sometimes you have, you don't have the, the right kind of friends in your life. And they told me, how can you, um, how, how, how are you going to serve the Lord uh, if, How are you going to just, just throw everything to the trash and you have so many talents? And um, how are you going to live uh, if you just live in the ministry, if you, just, if you just do this thing for God? And I kind of got really, like, very disappointed. And I was like, okay, I'm not doing that. And then I start, and I start attending art school. In art school, you see any kind of stuff. Oh, my goodness. Any kind of people you will see there weird and <laughs> weird people and I feel I feel real uncomfortable I really liked it what I was doing but I didn't like the environment where I was and you have to be really firm in what you believe for for you to be in a public university and um when I was 20 21 I went to a conference and Pastor Elmer Fernandez he was preaching and that's when God talked to me and he kind of remind me the promise that I made to him when I was 17 years old. And um, I came to Bible College when I was 24. I'm 29 years old. And when I came to college, before that, somebody came to a camp. I didn't know anything about Hal Sanderson College. Somebody came to a camp. Uh, at, uh, there was like 600 people. And um, I went to that camp that a pastor invited me so I can sing there. And I went there, and there's this a Spanish pastor that he came, and I never... I never knew this past. I, I never knew him. I don't know where he was. And he was preaching, and the last, it was a four-day camp. And on Sunday, it was from Thursday to Monday. And on Sunday night, he, he was preaching, and after he preached, he's like, I was on the phone with my wife. And I was talking to her, and I showed the videos of you singing. She, he was, like, literally in front of everybody saying that. And I was sitting in a corner all the way in the back. And he said, um, but my wife and I, we wanted to pay to pay college. And I was like, oh, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, we wanted to, we wanted to offer you a scholarship at Hyle Sanderson College. And I was like, uh, I don't know, because I was already studying at college. And that was kind of a blessing for me, because before that, I couldn't afford uh, to pay for a Bible college. And I wanted to go to Puerto Rico years before that. My mom He, she has always been so supportive. My mom is Christian now, but she has always been oh, so supportive. Like, whatever you want to do, just do it. I'll be praying for you. If that's the will of God, you're going to do it. She never said no to any of the things that I was like, crazy things. I'm like, okay, mom, I'll do it. And she's like, yeah, if you, if you fall, you're going to fall. And then, um, but this, this time, she was like, just pray about it. I prayed for a month, and I was fasting for a month. And after that, the college called me. I never gave them my information. But that pastor gave him my information after that month. And I was like, okay, God, I guess it's your will. And that's what I pray. They're going to call me. I don't know how, but they're going to communicate with me if this is your will. And I, I spent the whole month of February praying and fasting. And in March, they called me. And I started doing all the paperwork. And I can tell you that, all that in all that process, it was just the Lord. Because it's so hard to get a visa. So hard. And um, when I get to the to the cons to the cons to the, yeah to the embassy, and I was like so secure, but I was praying the whole time. I was nervous, and I was sweating. My hands were sweating, and I stand in front of the uh, of the of the guy, and he's like, "So you're going to college?" And I was like, "Yes." And I was answering all the questions in English. I didn't know a lot of English back then, and I was like, "Yes, sir." And I was like so secure. I didn't even remember. All the questions that he asked, but I can tell you that I was answering, and I don't even know how, but I was <laughs> answering in English. And then he's like, okay, your visa is approved. When he gave, when, when he told me that, I was like, <sighs> and I left, and it was just God and everything, the, 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 
the money for that for the ticket to come here and everything was the lord Amen. and i can tell you that the lord has blessed me in a big way and this year i'm gonna be i'm gonna be getting married and um the god gave god gave everything that i asked and more and just because one time i i i stand for what was right when i was a teenager and um i just give you an, an advice of the teenagers that are here, anybody, just stand for what is right and just keep faithful and the Lord is going to bless you in a big way. Amen. There's no treasure on earth that can move heaven's heart and purchase a pardon for me. No jewels or gems that I bring could start to pay my penalty. Even silver and gold are offerings to pour to take away guilt, but the truth my Lord, that is only by the blood you poured out for me. It's only by the blood I can stand redeemed. All the riches of this world can never be enough to take away our sins it's only by the blood to the temple they came and the altars ran red year after year after year Yet for all of the loss and all the life shed, still no through peace was near, till you came unto us as one perfect lamb, with thorns in your head and nails in your hands. And it's only by the blood you poured out for me. It's only by the blood I can stand redeemed. All the riches of this world could never be enough to take away our sins it's only by the blood what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus and it's only by the blood you poured out for me. It's only by the blood I can stand redeemed. All the riches of this world can never be enough to take. Away our sins, it's only by the blood. It's only by the blood. Only by the blood. Only by the Regret in the past, dreading the future, 
ashamed of my failures, bound by my fears. But the sweet God of comfort set on my heart. He spoke sweet words in my ear. My name is I am. My name's not I was. My Appreciate it. Turn your Bibles with me, if you will, this evening to Proverbs chapter number 4. Proverbs chapter 4. The preacher said if I go past 10 o'clock, you all start getting antsy, so I'll try to be done by then. I don't know about you, but sometimes if... if uh, a preacher for whatever reason, sometimes, you know, sometimes you just have those days where you have a hard time getting your brain engaged with what's going on, and so you kind of have a tendency to wander off a little bit, and with our, with our kids, we, my wife worked really hard as our kids were little to keep them focused and, you know, make them sit still in church when they were little, and I think those are great things, and sometimes, you know, when a kid is little, I, we were at a church last summer, and they had at this church on Sunday morning in the Sunday morning bulletin, on the back page of the bulletin, there was a coloring page. And it had to do with whatever the preacher was preaching on that Sunday. So the kid could sit there in color, you know, or the adult could sit there in color instead of paying attention to the preacher, let's be honest. I know. And so one of the things, this is kind of my way of, of helping you. This is me giving you a coloring page. One of the things that I... Um, 
find myself doing, if, if I'm sitting and listening to somebody else preach, which I do quite often, we have chapel every day and all of that, and so, uh, but sometimes my mind, because I have a little bit, I don't know, ADD or something maybe, but uh, if a preacher alliterates his message, you know, gives you points that all start with the same letter, I'll find myself occasionally wandering ahead in the message trying to figure out what the next point is, Okay. So I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to give you five points. They all start with a P and an A, and I'll tell you the passage. So if you find your mind wandering, you can just go to the passage, and maybe you'll get something out of it anyways. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, down through the end of the chapter is where we're going to be at. And the title of my message this evening is Guard Your Heart. Guard Your Heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let's pray this evening. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for this great church, Lord. What a, what a thought, just the name of the church, Lord, Heaven's View Baptist Church. Lord, if, if we just take a little bit of time to think about what it must be like to get just a little glimpse of heaven. Lord, you've given us in your word in a number of different places just little glimpses little things that you've promised to us, mansions that you're preparing, streets of gold, gates of pearl. Lord, so many things, but most importantly, of all that we have to look forward to in heaven is the fact that you'll be there, that we'll get to be in your presence for all of eternity. But Lord, while we're here on earth, I believe with all of my heart that once we're saved, the most important thing that we can do is to keep our heart with all diligence. Lord, you said in this passage that out of it are the issues of life. I pray that you'd help us this evening as we look at these few things, Lord, of different, different things that we can do, tangible things that we can do to guard our heart. I love you, Lord. I pray that you'd help me this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One of the things that's frustrating to me, now men in general, you ladies will agree with this probably, men in general, are, we don't like directions, Okay? We don't like, we like to figure things out, at least I do. Maybe I'm the exception to the rule, but probably not. We don't like to ask for directions. We don't like to, to stop and ask for directions. Praise the Lord now for GPS. Siri is my new best friend. My dad, the first time that he had a GPS in his car, he called me and he was driving. And this was before GPS was on the phone, so he just had a little Garmin or something in his car because he travels and preaches a lot. And he called me because he was driving. I knew he was by himself. And he says, Aaron, it's like your mom is with me all the time. <laughs> he said, wherever I go, she's with me, telling me, turn here, turn here, don't turn there. Hey, dummy, you took a wrong turn. I'm recalculating now because you went the wrong direction. But one of the things, oftentimes, even as a young person, that sometimes can be frustrating for us, and I find myself occasionally doing this with my children. I have one son, our oldest is a son, and the rest are girls. And, but even with my son, sometimes I find, I, I've found myself, he's in college now, but as he was growing, I'd find myself telling him to go do something. And he would say to me sometimes, Dad, I don't know how. I don't know how to do that. And sometimes, depending on what it was, I might say, figure it out. You figure it out. Sometimes we have a tendency to say we don't know how to do something because we really don't want to do it. I don't know. Again, I might be the only one that does that. I think I have children that do that sometimes. But he would say to me, you know, you'd say, Dad, I, I don't know how to do that. And sometimes I'd say figure it out. But sometimes I would think and say, you know what? He might actually not know how to do that. And I might get frustrated if he goes and tries to do it and does it wrong. So probably the best thing I could do is tell him how to do it. Or even show him how to do it. In one of the things about the Bible, there's a lot of things about the Bible that I love. I love the Word of God. And 
you'll find in the book of Proverbs, I used to think when I read Proverbs, I thought, man, every single verse seems like it's a completely different thought. You read one verse and then you read the next verse, they don't even seem like they're connected. It's like, it's like Solomon, you know, wisest man in all the world. He's the one that wrote the book and it seemed like he had ADD to me sometimes. When I'd read it, I'd be like, man, he was just over here and now all of a sudden he's over here. He's talking about wisdom, wisdom and then he's talking about the strange woman and then he's talking about this over here and what in the world. He's all over the place. But one of the things that really helped me with that in my King James Bible and probably in yours as well, there are little, looks like a backwards P, it's a paragraph mark. And I know that the verse markings were added later. They weren't in the original translation and all those things. I understand that. But those paragraph marks really helped me, particularly in the book of Proverbs, because it kind of gives you the idea that these verses were meant to be together. When you look at that and you look at those sections of verses, you'll see that verse 20 through 22 is a paragraph, if you will, and then verse 23 down through the end of the chapter is another paragraph. And so you look at those two things, and those are the two paragraphs in this story that we're going to kind of snatch out of the middle of it and look at this evening. But that, that verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything that you do, everything that you say, starts in your heart. Have you, ever, have you ever said something or heard somebody else say something, and they said after the fact, or you said after the fact, I don't know where that came from. The Bible tells us exactly where it came from. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Or you'd hear, you, you, you may hear, you see one of your children or do yourself, and you say, I don't even know why I did that. It's because your heart wanted to. Your mind might know better, but something inside of you wanted to do that. And you might look at it afterwards and think, man, that was really dumb. But in the moment, that's what your heart wanted to do. And that keep thy heart, as the word keep is like a gatekeeper, it's guard to stand guard around, to walk guard around your heart. There's something about, you think, I think of a guard at a gate in an old castle or something like that. And there's, you know, there's something about they, the reason that they changed shifts and they had three-hour shifts. You know, the night watches were for the guards that stood guard. They'd go in three-hour shifts because they wanted to make sure that whoever was on guard was alert and watching. And if they left somebody there for 12 hours all night long, there's a good chance they might fall asleep. No matter how interested they were, no matter how badly they wanted to do their job, they were constantly changing watches so that they would keep somebody there that was alert and paying attention. And that's the way it has to be if we're going to guard our hearts. Five areas this evening, that five different things that you say, guard your heart. That sounds like a good thing, Brother King, but what, do, what does that mean? What are some things that I can do to guard my heart? And that's what I plan to do this evening is just give you some things that Solomon gives us that we can do to guard our heart. First number, verse number 20 says this, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. The first one is pay attention. Pay attention. I'm not talking about just in church, but I'll tell you this, as 15 years as a youth pastor and then three and a half years as a pastor, one of the things that I found over and over again talking to young people and working with young people as a youth pastor, and they would come to me and they'd say, Brother King, I'm having this problem or struggling with this, and wouldn't you know that sometime probably within the last month before that, our pastor had preached a message on that very thing. Most of the counseling that a pastor does is done from right here. And if you'll just pay attention to what your pastor's preaching, you'll be amazed at how God gives you the answers for the difficult situations you're going to face this week. It's uncanny how God is able to tell your preacher what he's supposed to preach to get you through this week. Not just the preaching, your Bible reading. If you'll read your Bible and pay attention, if you'll just pay attention to the things that are going, around, uh, going on around you, he says this, he says a couple of things. First, he says in verse 20, My son, attend to my words. These are God's words. And he says, pay attention to them. 
Because the things that you're going to face, the things, the attacks that your heart is going to undergo, I've given you the solution. I've given you the defense that you need. He says, pay attention to my words, the actual words. Read the words and see what they say. Oftentimes, in the, just in dealing with people, whether it's college-age kids or teenagers or adults, they can be 7 or 70, and particularly adults, you'll see this, or college kids, they'll say, well, God just hasn't convicted me about that. Usually that's because they haven't prayed and asked God to convict them about that. God hasn't convicted me because I haven't let him. There's not as many gray areas in the Bible as we'd like to think that there are. God has no problem saying exactly what he means. But he says you have to pay attention. If we're going to stand guard, if we're going to keep our hearts, if we're going to guard our hearts, the first thing we have to do is we have to pay attention. He says in the rest of that verse, verse 20 there, he says, incline thine ear unto my saying. Have you ever noticed my, my wife has a way about knowing when I'm not really paying attention? She said, are you listening to me? Oh, yeah, I'm listening. What did I just, and sometimes I can't even repeat what she just said. Our kids could do the same thing, right? They might even be able to repeat what I just said, but that doesn't mean that they were really listening. When he says incline thine ear into my sayings, what he's saying is listen on purpose. Listen on purpose. When you come to church, come in the doors and say, God, please speak to me. Whatever the preacher has, would you please speak to me? Every service. Sunday school class, Bible study, institute on Monday nights, whatever it is, come into it asking God to speak to you and then listen. Listen for him. He says, incline thine ear. Our kids through the years occasionally, I've been doing other things that stay pretty busy most of the time and sometimes too busy. And I've had several times where one of my kids was trying to talk to me and they grab a hold of my face like this and say, Daddy, look at me. You know why they do that? They want me to incline mine ear to their sayings. They want me to listen to what they're saying. That's what Solomon says. If you're going to guard your heart, if I'm going to guard my heart, we have to pay attention, he says in the next two verses there, 21, 22. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. I won't take the time to turn there this evening but if you look at deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 6 through 8 he says exactly that he says these words if you'll keep them before you they will be life to you they will be as he says in those verses let them not depart from thine eyes keep them in the midst of thine heart he talks about the frontlets between thine eyes over there in deuteronomy and keeping them in your heart verse 22 for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. You, God, God will physically help you and give you a fuller life if you'll pay attention. If you'll pay attention. Like I said, there, there's a lot of problems in, a, in, in the average week that can be helped or avoided if you'll just pay attention to what God gives the preacher on Sunday. If we're going to stand guard around our hearts, young people, pay attention to what your mom and dad are telling you. Pay attention to what they say. Pay attention to when they read the Bible with you. Pay attention to those things. If you're going to guard your heart, you've got to, number one, pay attention. But number two, in verse number 24, he says, Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. The second thing we have to do is we have to put away Matthew chapter 15, verse number 11. Turn there with me, if you will, just quickly. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15 and verse 11, the Bible says this, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth this defileth a man. Not that which goeth into him, but that which cometh out of the mouth defileth a man. I mentioned already that the Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
If we're going to guard our hearts, if we're going to keep our hearts with all diligence, we have to pay attention. But secondly, we have to put some things away. We have to, on purpose, put things away. You know, in order for me to put something away from me, it has to be something that's by me. It has to be something that I have with me. That's already out, that I have to separate from me. If I'm going to put something away from me, preacher and I were talking about this. Him and I are a little bit kindred spirits in this area of we like cleaning things out and cleaning things up and for things to look neat. And I said, I just like when people put stuff away and my wife or to, when our kids, if they, when, when a child is old enough to get a toy out, that means they're old enough to put it back where they got it from. That's, I, I know that's a crazy concept, but at two years old, my kids were old enough to get toys out, and they were old enough to put them back where they got them from. It, it's not hard for a two-year-old to figure out where the Legos are to get them out, which means they know where the Legos go to put them back. It just takes a little bit of training. They have to be able to put them away, but they have to do it on purpose. And this idea of putting away from us, he says, to get rid of these things, a froward mouth and perverse lips. That word froward is just frowardness of crookedness of mouth. Perverseness of things that are twisting the truth maybe a little bit. Maybe telling a story that's a little bit on the edge of something that a Christian would say. Maybe embellishing a little bit in a story that you're telling about somebody else or about yourself. Maybe not just being completely honest. He says, put that stuff away from me. You know, there's a whole lot of liberty in just being, you know, you know the nice thing about telling the truth? It's not hard to remember what you said. Because it's the truth. If we'll just be honest, it's not hard to remember. But he says, if you're going to guard your heart, one of the things that so quickly can, can damage and, and discourage and twist our hearts is forwardness of mouth and perverseness of lips. Just not being completely honest and truthful in the things that we say. Or maybe being maybe gossiping about things. Maybe you say, well, I, everything I said about her was true. I'm telling you right now, Brother King. Just because it's true doesn't mean you need to say it. He says, put those things away from you. Remember, this is a father trying to help his son to guard his heart. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence. And the next thing he says is, watch what comes out of your mouth. But in order to watch what comes out of my mouth, I have to watch what's in my heart because that's where what comes out of my mouth comes from. Put away from you a froward mouth and perverse lips. Put far from thee. Number, verse number 25, number 3, it says this, Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. The third thing is peer ahead. That word peer, one of the definitions in the, in the Webster Dictionary is to look narrowly. To look narrowly. You know when you're peering at something, you're kind of focusing in on that one thing. When I was a boy growing up, not that I was ever a girl, I'm just saying, you know, when I was, when I was a little, but when I was a young boy, I have to clarify things sometimes. When I was, when I was growing, I grew up on a dairy farm, and I love it. My dad is a dairy farmer and a preacher. My whole growing up life, I love the farm. I love the country. I love everything about it. And one of the things that we got to do, Dad used to, Dad used to call them rock parties. We had rock parties on our farm. And lest you get a little bit distracted with what that is, that meant a whole bunch of kids walking through a field picking up rocks. <laughs> that was our rock party. And Dad would, we would take turns as young children, you know, as maybe five, six years old, we got to be old enough where we could drive the tractor. There was a tractor and a wagon behind it. Dad had six kids, his twin brother that farmed with him. My uncle had five kids. There's 11 of us kids, and then maybe some of the neighbor kids would come over or whatever, and we'd all walk along, and somebody was on the tractor pulling this wagon, and we're all picking up rocks and putting them 
on the wagon. Dad said, you have to pick up everything that's smaller than your fist. Well, my dad has like meat hooks for hands. His hands are and so he's picking up rocks that are this big. Well, if you're five years old, your hands are tiny. And he says, pick up anything that's smaller than your fist. You know, we're trying to make our fist bigger so we don't have to pick up any more rocks. But he says, we would take turns as little kids getting to drive the tractor. And there's a big 40 or 80 or 100 acre field. And you're on this tractor and you've got one job when you're on the tractor. And that is, go straight. Because when you get to the other end, you've got to turn around and you're going to come back straight the other direction and then back down straight that way. And depending on the size of the field, it might take 20 or 30 minutes to get from one end of the field to the other. But you're going, I mean, the tractor's barely moving. Dad would get up because we weren't big enough to push the clutch in and all that. Dad would get up, push the clutch in, shift it into low gear, and let the clutch out. And he'd say, okay, now, Aaron, on the other end of the field, there's a, row, there's a fence row. And there's fence posts every 16 to 20 feet. And he would say, you look out there, and you pick a fence post, and you drive straight at that fence post. Well, there's a lot of fence posts out there, first of all. Second of all, unless it's a cartoon, have you ever tried to get a five-year-old to stare at one thing for 30 minutes? <laughs> That's not even fair. And then, especially when you've got 10 other kids that are throwing rocks. Okay? Because a lot of other five, six, seven, eight year olds might not be a great aim with the rock. And it's a huge wagon, but there's also a tractor with a little kid in front of the wagon that there may occasionally be a rock come flying by you. And so it's easy to get distracted. And so I'm peering, you know, I'm trying to don't take your eyes off the fence post. Okay, then somebody throws a rock at you. Well, I don't care if you're five or 50. If somebody throws a rock at you, you're going to quit looking at the fence post and try to figure out where the rocks are coming from. And so sometimes you take your eyes off, and then you turn and look back, and you're like, man, they all look the same. They all look the same. And so then you try to get focus back in, but you pick one, and you're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the one I was looking at. It looks a lot the same, and so we're going to go at that one. And then something else happens, you get distracted, get refocused, whatever. And then you get to the end of the field, and you look back, and you know it's not hard to tell where you got distracted. It's not hard. Because you can see a straight line, and all of a sudden there's a straight line, but now it's going this direction. And then there's another straight line, but now it's going back this direction. You know why? Because we didn't do what it says in verse number 25. He says, let thine eyes look right on, and thine eyelids look straight before thee. If you and I are going to guard our hearts, we have to stay focused. We have to peer ahead. We have to look narrowly. We, you know, part of the reason that we don't guard our hearts is because we're so worried about everything else that's going around, we, we, going on around us. We lose focus on what we're supposed to be doing. We're so busy living the Christian life that sometimes we lose focus on what the Christian life was meant to be. And we get distracted with this or distracted with that and distracted with this. And I was so busy doing, you know, setting up for a banquet that I missed my Bible reading for a few days. He says, don't forget. Always, you know, I, I've heard my dad say for years, keep the main thing the main thing. Stay focused. The devil will constantly be throwing rocks. He'll constantly be doing all kinds of things to get you and I distracted. He said, let thine eyes look right on and thine eyelids look straight before you. Figure out where you're going and go there. And go. We're going to see a little bit more about that in just a minute. But he says, peer ahead. Look narrowly. Parents, raising your children, have a focused goal in mind. Do things on purpose. For a purpose. God gave, God gave our children, us as parents, because they're not supposed to raise themselves and because they won't make good decisions on their own. They may make some good decisions on their own, but God gave them parents for a reason. The next thing, number four, verse number 26, says, ponder the path of thy feet 
and let all thy ways be established. Number four is ponder your actions. That word ponder just means to think about. How many times have you heard somebody say or maybe said to yourself, oh man, I just, I just wasn't thinking. Ponder your actions. Think about, if I do this, what's that going to mean for my wife? What's that going to mean for my kids? What's that going to mean for ministry that God may have for me that I don't even know about 10 years from now? Think. We are, we are so reactionary in our lives. Instead of being actionary where, we're, where we take action, we just have a tendency oftentimes to react to things. This pondering, this thinking ahead, is what will help us to avoid that. You can't anticipate everything. You don't always know. We don't know what, what the Lord might allow, what the devil might throw at us, or what else might come into our life. And you can't, you know, nobody, nobody plans 20 years down the road for cancer. But you know, if we'll ponder our actions every day, you know what I find in my life? I have a very, very, very busy schedule, as most people do. And if I don't plan my day, I'll get to the end of the day and look back at it and say, man, I was so busy today. And my wife will say, what'd you get done? And I'll say, nothing. Nothing. Why? Because I didn't ponder my actions. And oftentimes that's what happens to Christians. You get 10 years down the road and say, what have you done in the last 10 years for the Lord? And sometimes as Christians, we have to look back and say, nothing. But I was... I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I came to church. and But what did you do for the Lord? Ponder your actions. Think about your path. Think about where you're headed. Where is it going? Think down the road. You will end up at the end of the road that you're on. You know, when I'm, when I'm going down the highway, if I'm on Highway 17... I'm going to end up wherever Highway 17 goes. I mean, I can get off the road. It'll be pretty rough. But if I'm going to be on the road, I'm, the, you hear preachers say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Who we hang around with. And by the way, can I say something, adults? It doesn't matter how, it, it doesn't matter if you're 18 or 80. That's still true. Who my friends are as a 41-year-old dad and husband matters just as much as who my friends were as a 14-year-old teenager. We need to surround ourselves with the right kind of people and the right kind of preaching and the right kind of teaching and the right kind of focus. We need to think ahead. Remember, this is all to help us guard our heart. If I'm going to guard my heart, I've got to take actions on purpose. You know, in the military, they don't just, when they had D-Day and the invasion of Europe, you know, they didn't just kind of, hey, let's just, let's just sail some ships over there and fly some planes over there and see what happens. No, they did planning and practice and all the preparation, all of this and everything. I mean, it had to go, and still there was massive loss of life. But for all of those things, I mean, it had to go like clockwork in order for it to be successful. But you know why that happened? Because they planned, because they pondered, because they planned for contingencies. And what if this happens? And what if this happens? And if this goes here, then this is what we're going to do here. And all of those things. Can I tell you that Hollywood has been planning for years Rock musicians have been making no bones for years about what exactly their plans are for our homes and our lives and our children. Why is it that Hollywood's been planning for 50 years what they're going to do with my children? Why, why would I allow them to have more of a plan for my kids than me? Or for my life than me? Or for my marriage than me? 
If I don't have a plan for my marriage, the devil does. If I don't have a plan for my life, the devil does. If I don't have a plan for my kids, the devil does. He says, ponder the path of your feet. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. When something's established, it's built. You know, I, I love seeing on the sides of buildings or in churches and different things established in 1817. You know what that means? It means it's been there and been the same for a long time. You know what your kids need? If you've got children or grandchildren, you know what they need 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now? They need to come back to Heaven's View Baptist Church and say it's the same as it always has been. It's established. You know what they need to know when they come back into your home 10 years from now or 20 years from now? That mom and dad are the same. I got my parents, my wife and I, shortly after we were married, we, uh, my, my parents had built a new home, and they built the home the year that we got married, 1998. And uh, we got them the next year for their anniversary. We got them a, one of those brass door knockers to go on their front door. And it said, Kings, that's our last name. And it said, Established, and the date of their anniversary that mom and dad were married. Except, I asked my sister, because I didn't know what their anniversary date was. And she told me the wrong date. So, <laughs> it's had... For 20 years, mom and dad have had a door knocker on their front door with the wrong anniversary date on it, and they remind me of that. But here's the thing. I, I've always said I'm going to get them a new one, but I never have. So it's there, and it's a conversation piece. But to know that my parents' home was established on that day and that my parents have been the same for my whole 41 years of life, that's a big deal to me. I was home for Christmas, and you know what? My mom and dad are the same. They'll be, they're 69 years old, both of them are this year, and they're the same. My dad's been at his church. He got, he's, he's been at his church for 48 years. He got saved in that church. A year later became the youth pastor, was a youth pastor for 17 years, then was the pastor for 28 years, and now he's been the missions pastor for five or six years. You know what that is? That's established. That's established. Ponder your actions. Let your ways be established. The last, verse number 27. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Plan to avoid. Plan to avoid. Failing to plan, or failing to plan is planning to fail. He says in that verse, turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. You say it's a lot like the previous verse. No, the previous verse says think about it in ahead. But then this verse says once you've planned ahead, once you've pondered it, once you've thought about it, don't deviate from it. Go do it. Carry out those things that you've planned. And plan to avoid the trouble. You know, in a car, when you're driving a car, most cars have a spare tire. You know, if you're going to take a long trip, one of the things that's a good idea to do is check your spare tire. I'm planning ahead, I'm planning my trip, and I'm planning to avoid things, but I'm also preparing for those things. If they come, I'm going to plan to avoid a tow truck bill and all these other things if something happens. We tell the young people at the college because of where we're at geographically, and if you've looked at all at the forecast for Crown Point, Indiana this week, on Wednesday, the high temperature is going to be 15 degrees below zero. That's the high temperature. 120 in Arizona is looking real good, at least for a couple of days. <laughs> High temperature, 15 degrees below zero. So what do we do? We tell the young people in, at college in chapel, look, if you have to go somewhere, plan ahead. Don't, you know, don't, uh, the young ladies, don't go out by yourself. If you're going out, make sure that you have 
an extra blanket in your car, make sure you have, you're dressed warmly just in case something breaks down, prepare for those things, have a cell phone, make sure your cell phone's fully charged, make sure you know who to call, have the college numbers, we can call you security or one of us will come and get you, help you, all those things. Don't go you know, by yourself out to your car late at night and all that. That's true anytime, but especially in the cold weather because you never know, people try to... And just all of these things, why? Because we're trying to help them plan to avoid the potential pitfalls. You and I, if we're going to guard our hearts, have to plan to avoid some things. We have to understand that the devil is real. We have to understand that the devil is after... You know, we, we say all the time, the devil is after our children. The devil is after our children's parents. The devil is after our children's grandparents. The devil is after us. And if we don't plan to avoid what he has, he's got a plan. He has a plan. And if we don't prepare for that, we're not standing guard around our heart. You know, there's always, you know, in the, in the military, my son loves to read military history, and he's talking about, you know, he loves especially World War II history, and he's reading about Eisenhower and Patton and all these guys and different things that they've done. And then he says, Dad, and don't worry, I'm not a Nazi, but he says, Dad, that I don't know if, if you read war history at all, if you've ever read a book on Rommel, he was a commander for the German army. And just in reading about some of the things he did, he said, Dad, that guy was a genius. If Hitler hadn't made him do a bunch of stuff that he didn't want to do, he said he probably would have been successful at what he was attempting to do. Why? Because he planned to avoid pitfalls. He planned ahead. He had the focus in mind. He was prepared. We have to understand, if we're going to guard our heart, we're in a battle. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence. But he says this at the end of the verse. He says, for out of it are the issues of life. The issues of life is everything you do in your life starts right here. It starts right here. And that's where it comes from. You're here at church today for one reason or another it, had, it, it went through here before you decided to come to church. You might have wrestled with it. You might have said, this is what we always do. You might have been excited about it. Whatever the case, at some point, it went through here before you came to church tonight. But everything that we do, every minute of every day, goes through here. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence. How do I do that? That's an easy thing to say and a hard thing to do. It is a hard thing to do. That's why we're commanded to do it. If we just did it naturally, he wouldn't have to tell us to do it. The Bible commands that God gives us the Ten Commandments. The reason he gives us those things is because we don't just do them by accident. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The people that are struggling in life, the people that fall into sin, guaranteed at some point they stop guarding their heart. His desire, Solomon's desire for his son was to be successful, to live a happy and peaceful and wonderful life that was pleasing to God Almighty. And he said, if you're going to do that, these are some things you have to do. You have to pay attention. You have to put some things away, a forward mouth, perverse lips. You have to peer ahead. You have to look narrowly. You have to be focused on the path. You have to know where you're going. You have to to keep your eyes in the right direction. You have to ponder your actions. Think about them. Think about them. Have a plan for the future. And then last year, you have to plan to avoid. Plan to avoid the pitfalls. They're going to come. The potential difficulties, the temptations, all of those things are going to come. And if you don't have a plan, if I don't have a plan to avoid them, we will fall. Sooner or later, we will fall. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed this evening. Again, I appreciate so much your attention. I don't know where you're at. Obviously, I've not been here before.
I don't know what you might be struggling with or what a family member of yours might be struggling with. But let me ask you a question. Are you guarding your heart? If you, if you, if you looked at your heart like an egg, somebody handed you a raw egg in the shell and said, I'm going to check on you in five years. And if the egg wouldn't get rotten, they said the condition of the egg in five years will determine what God can do with you. How closely would you guard that egg? It's fragile. Lots of things can break it. Lots of things can damage it. But you have to take it with you everywhere you go. It's not just don't leave home without it. It's you physically can't leave home without it. It's your heart. What are we doing to guard our heart? I'm going to ask everybody to stand if you would. Heavenly Father.